Syrians accused Hamas of betraying their country after years of financial, political, military, and even intelligence support from Damascus. Even the senior leaders of Hamas uh, have had a very luxurious and very, I would say, uh, first-class uh, lifestyle in uh, bourgeoisie lifestyle in uh, Damascus and all supported by the Syrian government or the government of President Bashar al-Assad. Now, I would like to mention here something. There are some people who say that this support for Hamas was popular because the people wanted to support Hamas or the resistance, right? And they say it's not a favor from the government in Damascus. It's the people who wanted to help. And that could be relatively true. But let's check the surrounding of Syria and Palestine. For example, in Egypt and in Jordan, if you go and ask the people, I think 90 people out of 100 people, they support the Palestinian cause. But are these countries presenting or delivering any tangible support to the Palestinian cause? That's the question. I don't think so. Egypt, on one hand, is even imposing a blockade on uh, the Gaza Strip. They, they open some of the uh, corridors for or the border crossings for special cases, and they send some humanitarian aid. But we're talking about military support, political support. No. The same case goes for Jordan, for example. So, in my opinion... Even if the people want to support a certain cause, if the government isn't supporting that cause, the people do not always have the means to support the cause. So there should be a governmental or a higher level embracement for this cause. And this has happened in Syria in the past decades. And the Syrian uh, leadership, they have provided all sorts of support, as I mentioned. But in 2011, Hamas decided to leave Damascus and uh, the senior officials of Hamas, they left Damascus to Qatar, Doha, which hosts one of the biggest uh, American military bases in the region, right? And Qatar him itself is uh, in very good terms with the United States and even tacitly with Israel, I would argue. So why has Hamas went to Qatar? This is the question of today's episode. And... Uh, just a spoiler alert, this is not going to be a short video, so brace yourself. This is an educational video. I have did lots of research and I brought some articles for you so we can go through together. So if you want to get uh, something very fast, this is not for you guys. Let's, uh, for those who want to learn, let's dive together in our first article because uh, Hamas declared that it wants to normalize ties with Syria. They officially declared it. Hamas normalizes ties with Syria under Iranian mediation. Hamas officially announced the resumption of relations with the Syrian government after a decade-long hiatus caused by the 2011 Syrian uprising, quote-unquote, raising questions about the gains Hamas might achieve and why Iran sought to mediate the reconciliation. So the author, apparently she is Palestinian, based in Gaza Strip, so she could have her own opinion about what happened in Syria, which she thinks maybe it's a, a, a uprising or revolution or whatever. But all in all, the article shows why Hamas uh, wants to uh, reconcile with Syria. So let's dive in together. In a statement on September 15, Hamas officially announced the resumption of diplomatic relations with the Syrian government after a decade-long hiatus caused by the Islamist movement's support for the 2011, I would say, NATO-backed regime change war in Syria, not the Syrian revolution. In its statement, Hamas stressed ongoing efforts to, quote, to build and develop solid relations with the Syrian Arab Republic within the framework of its decision to resume diplomatic relations with our brothers in Syria. And I would like to ask here, can, I mean, diplomatically speaking, uh, Hamas cannot resume diplomatic relations with Syria. Hamas is not a country. Hamas is an organization. Hamas can have ties with uh, Syria, Damascus, relations 
but there is no diplomatic relations between Syria and there is no Hamas embassy in Damascus. This is just ties. So this was also manifested um, by an article published in a semi-official uh, new Syrian newspaper, Al Watan, uh, I think two weeks ago. And they ridiculed the statement of Hamas saying that, what does Hamas think itself? Is it a country? No, it's just an organization. There was no diplomatic relations and there will be no diplomatic relations with Hamas. It's just ties that they severed and now they are coming back to Syria after the project of the Muslim Brotherhood led by the American administration or the successive administrations has failed. Hamas also says, quote, Syria has embraced our Palestinian people and the resistance factions for decades, which requires us to stand with it today in light of the brutal aggression it is facing. So this statement is a reference to the recent Israeli airstrikes in Syria. So I would like to raise a few points here. One, if Syria embraced the Palestinian people for and the Palestinian cause, the resistance for decades, why has Hamas abandoned Syria in the first place? This is question one. The second thing here, the Palestinians in Syria were treated very well comparing to any regional country. The only thing that they didn't enjoy is the right to gain citizenship in Syria because Syria believes in the right of return for the Palestinians to uh, Palestine. Therefore, they don't want to give citizenship that could kill this, um, I would say, demand uh, that Palestinians who were displaced from their territory, they should go back to uh, Palestine. But other than that, Palestinians were, uh, they have the right to study, they have the right to work, they have the right to buy uh, territories, lands, everything in Syria. They were treated equally, right? Comparing to, for example, in Lebanon, they live in camps. And in Syria, they were in a very nice neighborhoods. For example, Yamuk camp. It is called camp, but it's a very big neighborhood and it is uh, a nice place to live. And I was there a few times and unfortunately after the war, it's completely distracted now. So by the end of 2011, Hamas left its offices in Damascus after condemning the Syrian government's violence crackdown on the popular uprising. I mean, I mean, the author is obviously biased towards the Islamists, but, um, Hamas didn't leave Syria because there was a brutal crackdown on a popular resistance. Hamas itself uh, brutally cracked down on the protesters in the Gaza Strip. So they don't have the moral high ground to say that. Secondly, they left because they chose their Muslim Brotherhood identity over their Palestinian identity. They chose that their Muslim Brotherhood regional project cause that can stretch from Turkey, Syria, Egypt, Tunis, Libya, where all these so-called Muslim Brotherhood forces were gaining momentum, they wanted to be part of that project. This is the truth. But this is not correct that they, oh my God, they felt like uh, there is a crackdown, so they want to leave. I mean, we're not stupid. We know what happened. Hamas began to have a change of heart vis-a-vis -vis the Syrian revolution after having disengaged from the Muslim Brotherhood, redefining itself as Palestinian resistance movement only in its new political charter that was announced on May the 1st, 2017. In its previous charter, Hamas had defined itself as one of the branches of the Muslim Brotherhood in Egypt. So in 2017, when the Muslim Brotherhood was defeated in Tunisia, defeated in Egypt, and even the Erdogan uh, power has been diminished in the region, uh, the movement uh, really decided that they want to be a Palestinian uh, faction and not a branch of uh, the Muslim Brotherhood. So this is the exact point that I mentioned previously. They didn't leave Syria because... <laughs> Uh, there was a crackdown. They left Syria because they chose to be a Muslim Brotherhood over being a Palestinian uh, faction. So um, what was this statement in 2017? Because they chose to be uh, a Palestinian, right? So I will, I will show you what have they decided recently. Hamas defies charter recognizes 1967 borders. So Hamas never recognized the legitimacy of Israel. They never recognized the borders of the 67. They wanted to liberate entire Palestine. 
So they changed this in 2017, according to their new charter, after their leaders have moved to Qatar. Maybe Qatar convinced them or Turkey convinced them. I don't know. But this is the new, um, I would say, direction of Hamas. It's official. The Islamic resistance movement Hamas announced on May 1st, 2017, that it recognizes Israel's 1967 borders. This is no tribal matter. The underlying Hamas charter issued nine months after the movement was founded in 1988 left no room for such a compromise. So when they uh, were formed, they weren't ready to compromise or recognize Israel as a legitimate entity. Sheikh Ahmad Yassin and other members of the founding team clearly delineated the borders of the Islamic Palestinian state they aspired to establish from the Mediterranean Sea to the Jordan River, including all of Israel and the West Bank. The charter presented the Israeli-Palestinian conflict as a clash between Islam and Jewish heretics. It ruled out any future leeway by designating the land on which Israel was founded as Waqf, Arabic for sacred endowment. It warned that whoever gives it up would be considered a hidden and traitor to the Islamic religion. So Article 11 of the Hamas uh, Covenant declares, quote, the land of Palestine is an Islamic waqf consecrated for future Muslim generations until Judgment Day. It, or any part of it, should not be squandered. It, or any part of it, should not be given up. Neither a single Arab country, nor all Arab countries, neither any king or president, nor all the kings and presidents, neither any organization, nor all of them, be they Palestinian or Arab, possesses the right to do that. So it was very clear Israel would never recognize, uh, sorry, Hamas would never recognize the borders of Israel. And uh, until recently, in 2017, this has apparently changed. And... Um, they recognized the 1967 borders, and as I mentioned, was there any role by Qatar and Turkey in this regard? I'm not sure. But since they moved out of Syria, it seems their uh, discourse has changed a little bit. Um, this is very important to, um, to see how Hamas has changed its behavior after changing the geographics of uh, the geography and their offices, where, where are they located? So as I mentioned, wherever you live, maybe the people are embracing you, but it's the government, it's the leadership that decides the headlines of the policy of the state, right? So if we go back to this article, we will see that a prominent Hamas leader who asked not to be named told El Monitor that the resumption of relations with Syria will be followed by the reopening of the movement's offices in Damascus in the near future. So there will be offices again in Damascus for Hamas. But he made it clear that the Hamas office in Damascus would not be a sub substitute for the movement's main political office in the Qatari capital of Doha, but rather a branch of the movement's offices located in several countries such as Turkey, Algeria, and Beirut. So Hamas has different offices. Their main headquarter was in Damascus. They left to Doha, and they don't want to make Damascus again a headquarter for them. The headquarter stays, I'm going to say Bleib, it's like in German, stays in uh, Doha, but uh, they want to open office for their second-class officials in Damascus. So as they, they mentioned here, the leader said that Damascus office will include second rank leaders as opposed to the situation prior to 2011 when top Hamas officials were based in the Syrian capital, which was the base of Khaled Mesh'al, Hamas's head at the time. So this Hamas source, he noted that Hamas still prefers that its main office remain abroad and that its current head, Ismail Haniye, stay in Qatar. Due to several political and security considerations, the most important of which is that the world views Qatar as a moderate country and this serves Hamas. This is very funny because a Palestinian movement that says they are resisting Israeli occupation, they want to stay in Qatar that enjoys brilliant ties with 
uh, the United States, which is the biggest ally of Israel, and they have a big base there. And he thinks that he's safe in Qatar, that nothing would happen to him. And I wonder why nothing would happen to him in Qatar comparing to Damascus. And if he is such a... Um, if he's such a strong man who wants to resist an occupation, right? Why is he even afraid for his life? I thought uh, the term fida'i or the fida'iin is someone who sacrifices himself. And if the leader isn't ready to sacrifice himself, I don't understand the logic behind it. So the leader of the group wants to stay safe in Qatar. He doesn't want to come to Syria because there are Israeli airstrikes. Funny, funny. And also because Qatar is a moderate country, unlike Syria. Because for him, Syria is perceived, the Syrian government is perceived as a repressive regime with the highest records of human rights violations. <laughs> as if they're shy, you know? Like, if the United States and the rest of the... Um, NATO camp is accusing uh, Syria of human rights violations, then Hamas should take that into consideration. What kind of resistance group is this? Anyways, the source added, also the security situation in Syria remains precarious with the ongoing sporadic Israeli airstrikes on the capital and several Syrian towns, which is another reason for Hamas not to base its top leaders in Damascus, as I mentioned. If you are resistant, or resisting, or you are um, a fighter against an oppression or against an occupation, you should be ready to die. That's the point. But you want to stay pushy pushy in a comf in a comfy place in Qatar while guiding your men to go and die. This is why I don't buy what Hamas says nowadays or their leadership. So. This is the basic, I would say. Oh my God. So this is basically what is happening in uh, regarding uh, Hamas. However, I would like to add a few factual informations in this regard, and the first of which is an article published on the Cradle, or the Cradle, Cradle. I think a lot of the information mentioned in this article is factual, and it's correct. Regime change in Hamas and the return to Syria. In mid-September, so Palestinian resistance movement, Hamas issued a statement indicating that it had restored relations with Syria after 10 years of estrangement, effectively ending its self-imposed exile from Damascus. After the outbreak of the Syrian crisis in March 2011, at the height of the so-called Arab Spring, Hamas, in line with its parent organization, the Muslim Brotherhood, Ikhwan al muslimin as I mentioned, look, this is what I mentioned exactly. This is what happened. Turned its back on its once staunch Syrian ally and threw its support behind the mostly Islamist revolution. As governments collapsed in key Arab states, the Ikhwan left or felt the time was ripe for their organization to ascend to a leadership role from Gaza to Egypt, Libya, Tunisia, and Syria. This is very, very accurate evaluation and analysis. <laughs> Whoever believes they left Syria because of the crackdown of the governments against the protesters is definitely uh, either lying or is just completely unaware of the situation back then. Anyways, yet the decision by Hamas's leadership to leave Damascus was met with strong opposition from influential circles within the movement, especially in its military arm, Al-Qassam Brigade. Despite Hamas' official position towards Syria, internal opposition to the break in relations remained for years, most notably from Hamas co-founder Mahmoud al-Zahar and a number of al-Qassam brigade leaders, such as 
Muhammad al Daif, or all these names. So there were opposition among it, but they couldn't do anything. Today, that balance has shifted notably because Sinwar is currently Hamas's leader uh, in the Gaza Strip and his alliance is in strong ascendance within the movement. So how did they move from... So as you may know, first, before they come to Damascus, they were in um, Amman, in Jordan, right? So in 2011... The person with the final say over the decision to abandon its Syrian ally was the then head of Hamas political bureau, Khaled Mishal. Okay. Mishal was the director of Hamas office in Amman, in Jordan, in 1999, when the Jordanian government decided to expel him. So the Jordanian government told him, you're a persona non grata, go find yourself somewhere new to sit. And he traveled between the airports of a number of Arabic countries, and all of them refused to receive, to receive him under the pretext that there were agreements with a superpower requiring his extradition. Back then, in 1999, only Damascus agreed to receive him. Despite the tension that historically prevailed in the Syrian state's relationship with the Muslim Brotherhood, Mishal was given freedom to work and build a personal relationship with the Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. In the years that followed, Hamas was granted facilities and resources that it didn't enjoy in any other Arab capital. Plain and simple and true. He had a personal relationship with Assad. He had the embracement of Assad. He received support that no other organization received in Syria. Syria opened its doors to train hundreds of resistance fighters from Al Qassam brigades and to manufacture quality weapons such as missiles and reconnaissance drones. One Syrian source told the cradle that the privileges enjoyed by Hamas leaders and members in Syria were not available even to Syrian citizens. In addition to the high cost of Mishal's residence and security in Damascus, the state provided him and his associates with dozens of luxury homes in the capital's most aff affluent neighborhoods. As I told you, he lived a very luxurious life. He was treated like a VIP, like... Uh, head of state in Damascus, personal phone calls with the president, meetings after work, drinking tea together, etc. So that's why the people in Syria say Hamas betrayed Syria. Because they are, even after all this support they have received, they abandoned Syria in the middle of their crisis. Syria was also at the forefront of countries that facilitated the arrival of high-quality weapons into the besieged Gaza Strip. A source in the resistance tells the cradle that the first coordinate missile to reach Gaza between 2009 and 2011 came from Syria with the approval of Assad and was received by the chief of staff of Al-Qassam Brigades, Ahmad al-Jabari. I think this here, the Iranian side and the Hezbollah side came to Damascus and asked uh, Assad, uh, that they're capable of delivering this type of weaponry to Gaza. So would you accept that we give some of our cornets to uh, the cornets that Hezbollah received from Syria? Um, so do you mind if you if we send some of the cornets that you gave us to Gaza Strip? And Assad asked him, are you able to do that? And they say, yes. So Assad gave his green light and these weapons arrived in the Gaza Strip. So Meshal chose, he chose Doha over Damascus after 2011. So let's see the context of this because it's very important to understand why this happened exactly and not because there was a crackdown. Why exactly happened? It is important to recognize that while the decision to leave Damascus was not by any means unanimously agreed upon within Hamas as political bureau chief, it was ultimately Meshal's call. A Hamas source told the cradle that in 2011, six months after the outbreak of the Syrian crisis, Mishal received an invitation from the Qatari Prime Minister and Minister of Foreign Affairs at the time, Hamad bin Jassim al Thani, to visit Doha. He recalled that Qatar was one of the first states to fund an armed Islamist opposition in the brutal Syrian war. Correct. 
According to the Al Sani's estimates, the Syrian revolution, quote unquote, was likely to end in the overthrow of the Assad government. He is reported to have advised Mish'al to abandon the sinking ship, so to speak, because if the rebellion is successful, those who stayed with him or with Assad will drown, as happened with the late President Yasser Arafat when Saddam Hussein was defeated in the Gulf War. In an attempt to win over Hamas from Iran's patronage, Al Thani offered to financially support the movement and to provide a geographical space for operations in the Qatari capital and in Turkish territory. Meshal is said to have informed his host that such a decision could not be taken unilaterally and that he needs, needed to refer to Hamas political bureau and Shura Council for buy-in. So he went to his organization, to Hamas leadership, and there was an internal opposition for his decision. So what happened here is, on his way back to Damascus, Meshal made pit stops in a number of regional countries to inform Hamas leadership of the Qatari offer. Suffice it to say, the deal was rejected by the majority of members of the political bureau and Al-Qassam brigades. Mishal's opponents were on the opinion of the opinion that as Hamas is a resistance movement, it would be ill-advised to severe ties with the region's axis of resistance, Iran, Hezbollah, and Syria, and that leaving this alliance left little options other than to join the axis of normalization with Israel. So if you if you're leaving the axis of resistance, these countries call themselves or the players call themselves axis of resistance against Israel or American hegemony in the region. So if you're leaving this axis, which axis are you joining? Is there a middle ground in it? Or there is the other axis that wants to normalize relations with Israel. And back then it seems that Hamas chose to be on the side that is normalizing relations with uh, Israel. Um, so there were lots of meetings happened uh, during this period. Mash'al was later invited to visit Turkey, where he met leaders of Syrian armed groups, accompanied by the Qatari Minister of Intelligence and officers from the Turkish intelligence. They convinced him that a few steps separate the opposition from the Republican palace in the Mazze neighborhood of Damascus and that the days of the Assad regime are numbered. So the rebels are storming the Damascus. In a few days or a few weeks or a few months, they will remove him from power. So if you stay with him, this is a sinking ship. So you will lose legitimacy. You will lose your reputation. So come join us. Join the side of the rebels. He's already going. So there is no point of staying with Assad. So Mishan decided to move. <coughs> The meeting of Hamas political bureau in Damascus was a turning point. In that gathering, to the surprise of some participants, both Misha Haniye and Abu, Abu Mavzu weighed in to the side with Mishal, and it was decided to discreetly withdraw from Damascus. After the decision was taken, the Qataris worked to further enhance Mishal's position within Hamas through an extraordinary visit by the Emir of Qatar, Hamad bin Khalifa al Thani, to the Gaza Strip, the first foreign Arab head of state. During this visit, al Thani provided generous support with more than 450 million provided for reconstruction and the implementation of development projects. I wonder how much from this 450 million was pocketed by the Mish'al and Haniya and his circles. Hamas' fateful decision to abandon Damascus, however, was not met with the same enthusiasm by the movement's military wing who believed the move made little strategic sense. So there was a rift between the political and the military wings, and the military wings thought that abandoning Damascus makes no geopolitical sense because uh, they received their power and training and uh, support from Damascus and the access that Damascus belongs to, and abandoning it means that they are... Uh, deprived from this uh, tangible support to continue their armed struggle against Israel. So now they want to come back to Damascus. In the following years, we know a lot of regional changes happened, for example, that contributed to the downfall of Khaled Mishal and his removal from his position leading Hamas political bureau. So what happened during this time? That Khalid Mash'al also fell. The Syrian state remained steadfast in the face of collective NATO Gulf efforts to unseat Assad. 
Russian military intervention altered the battlefield balance of power. The Syrian political and armed opposition began to disintegrate and suffer heavy losses. The Ikhwans, or Muslim Brotherhood rule in Egypt and its control over Libya and Tunisia began to collapse, and the standoff with Qatar caused Saudi Arabia and the UAE to alter their position on Syria. Plain and simple. Lots of things happened that were changed that changed the balance of power in the region again in favor of Damascus. The regime change war failed. The rebels disintegrated, a rift between uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE on one hand, and Qatar on the other hand, and the Muslim Brotherhood rule in Tunisia, Egypt, and Libya um, has collapsed. So their hope for having a big regional power has also collapsed with itself. With these stunning regional setbacks, it quickly became apparent that neither Qatar nor Turkish support offered any real strategic value for Hamas resistance model, nor could they hope to fill the void left by the reduction in Iranian and Syrian military support. Moreover, Al-Qassam brigades found itself facing severe financial difficulties, unable to secure the salaries of its members, let alone sustain any meaningful armed resistance against Israel's continuous assaults and occupation. So, um, Mesh'al fell here. Uh, this was very important that Mesh'al, he realized at least that the regional changes were no longer in his favor, tried to flatter the Syrian state more than once in media statements, but a firm decision had already been taken across the axis of resistance that Mesh'al was no longer a welcome or trustworthy figure. So his isolation, Mishal's isolation, become crystal clear at the end of December 2021 when he visited Lebanon and Hezbollah refused to receive him during his visit, even though he was officially the external relations officer for Hamas. So now we have a post mishal Hamas and from a regime change war in Syria into a regime change in Hamas. <laughs> Mishal. Mishal, so this is very important. According to Hamas source, Mishal tried to disrupt the consensus of the leadership of the political bureau and the Shura Council on restoring relations with Syria when he leaked at the end of last June the decision taken in the political bureau meeting to return to Damascus. And this leak caused media chaos, followed by attempts to pressure Hamas to reverse course. A statement issued by eight of the most important Muslim Brotherhood scholars advised Hamas to reconsider its decision because of the great evils it carries for the Ummah. If they go back to Damascus, it will bring so much evil to the Ummah. But if they go to stay in uh, Turkey or in Qatar, those are the faithful and believing and uh, very, I would say, um, um, very resistant uh, countries against the American uh, and the Israeli uh, hegemony in the region, so they have to stay there. They can't come back to Damascus because Damascus is so evil. Anyways, Meshal, meanwhile, remained busy trying to restore relations with Jordan in parallel with Iran, Lebanon, and Syria. However, with the recent announcement by Hamas that it would return to Syria, the efforts made by Meshal and the Qataris behind him have gone unheeded. So the normalization of relations between Hamas and Syria is significant not only for the military di dividend it could reap for the Palestinian resistance, but also because it can pave the way for Turkey and Qatar to reestablish their Syrian ties, although Doha would do so very reluctantly. So with the decision to sideline the Mish'al camp within Hamas, it would seem that Hamas and not Syria has ultimately been the subject of regime change in its in this regional geopolitical battle for influence. So this was uh, Khaled Mishal carrying the Syrian so-called revolution flag, the flag of the Islamists who committed horrendous crimes in Syria. And this is also the photo of Ismail Haniye also holding the flag of this um, 
flag that lots of terrorist organizations carried in Syria in the past years. And one of the most uh, influential figures uh, that advised uh, Hamas in 2011 was the spiritual leader of the Muslim brother Yusuf al-Qaradawi, one of the most radical clerics in the region. And he is called by many Syrians and Libyans by um, his title is the Mufti of NATO. He uh, issued fatwas for murdering Gaddafi. He legitimized the NATO intervention in uh, Libya by issuing lots of fatwas and giving lectures on the necessity of removing the dictatorship of Gaddafi and installing uh, or democratizing this country, just like Qatar, you know? Uh, so, and then he issued lots of fatwas of murder, uh, of uh, legitimizing murder in Syria, and he said uh, he 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 thinks that murdering Syrians who support the Syrian government is legitimate, whether they are soldiers or civilians. And I will show you this video. So he receives a question on Al Jazeera, one of the biggest, uh, the biggest, I would say, news channel in the Arab world. And uh, the person is asking him whether it is permissible to kill pro-government Syrians if they are civilians and not carrying arms. So a lot of rebels listen to him. And if they catch you and you are a supporter of the government, you will be decapitated thanks to such fatwas. And a lot of people do not know these things and they don't know the influence of these clerics. He has tens of millions of followers in the Arab world. He's one of, he was one of the most influential clerics in the Arab world and he died yesterday. I would say thankfully because such people are spreading evil. Anyways, let's see what he said. سؤال سؤال من أكثر من مشاهد ننقل سيرة الأخ عبد الغني يقول هل يجوز استهداف من يؤيد النظام السوري كما يقول القاتل وعلى رأسهم علماء السلطة وهل يجوز قتل عامة العسكريين الذين ما زالوا واقفين مع النظام مع العلم أن فيهم من ينوي الشيطان؟ So the question is is it permissible to kill pro-government scholars so Islamic clerics and is it also permissible to kill the soldiers? Uh, that are maybe intending to defect from the Syrian army. So he says, how do I know that uh, that is true? How do I know that they want to defect? Those who work with the regime, it's a duty that we fight them all. So, whether they are armed forces, civilians, religious scholars, or ignorance, they have to fight them all. إذا كان في واحد مظلوم الله سبحانه وتعالى سيدافع عنه وسيأخذ حقه واتقوا فتنة لا تصيبن الذين ظلموا منكم خالد. So if these rebels killed someone and this someone was maybe innocent, he wasn't even a pro government, he said, then God will protect him, he will defend him later. So I would say, um, Lots of mixed feelings, lots of uh, information um, on the Muslim Brotherhood, on Hamas, on these clerics and the bloodshed that happened in Syria. And uh, don't don't forget that this Khalid Mishal and Ismail Haniyeh people, they delivered their military expertise to the so-called rebels, to Jabhat al-Nusra, especially in al Yamuk camp. They had themselves uh, a fighting group there. They uh, taught them how to dig tunnels, how to fire rockets. Uh, they told, they trained them on carrying weapons, on kidnappings, on lots of things. They did horrible things. And now they say there is a change in the discourse and the leadership is changed. They want to come back to Syria. And I can assure you, 
from the pro-government side, the vast majority of the Syrians, because I follow uh, their reactions, comments, hundreds of the comments, I would say, on public pages, on Facebook, the mood is not in favor of receiving Hamas again and reopening there. So there may be some officers, uh, second rank officials that nobody knows them, you don't even know that he's from Hamas. But if they see anyone from Hamas that is senior or his face is known, I think people will not be happy and they will be unwelcoming. And unfortunately, this is the... Um, nobody is blamed but Hamas for its sins. They have chosen this path and they have lost the hearts and the minds of millions of Syrians that they suffered a lot during this NATO-backed regime change war. So what do you think about the return of Hamas to Damascus? What is your opinion? And how do you convince uh, the Syrians uh, that suffered a lot in the past 11 years to just forget everything what happened and accept and embrace this organization again? I've been your host, Kirok Almasen of Syrian Analysis. If you're new, please subscribe and hit the like button. It's a great help for me for the algorithm. And also, if you want to support my independent uh, commentary work, there are so many means in the description below. You can see Patreon. You can see uh, the, um, you can become a member of Syrian Analysis. You can support me through many ways. It's a great help, great help guys thank you so much for your consistent and general support i'm very thankful and thanks to you i can continue in this work that i like and i also like to deliver to you this information so that we can all be informed of what is happening in the region and abroad and see you next time